Oh, you're kidding. No, I'm not trading my own posse stickers for a speaker badge. I can get those anytime I want. <laughs> Dude, I gave this away at Hacker Jeopardy last night. <laughs> I, I, no, I don't want her underwear. No, I mean, the vinyl vanna is crashed out in my room right now. I've got plenty of underwear to pick from. All right, if you're still on this track for the next talk, uh, I still have a couple more badges so you can warn people if they have cool swag to give away to trade for a speaker badge. Um, that'd be cool. And now I'm, I'm, it's my somewhat distinct pleasure to introduce Seth Hardy somewhat distinct pleasure because every year, I figure I'll just get this taken care of now because I have other crap to do right now, is that every year at con when he speaks here, I stand in the back of the audience and yell, Shardy is full of shit. So now I'm up here and saying that right before he's about to talk. So Seth Hardy, everybody. I guess Nick already introduced me, so uh, the title of <clears throat> uh, the title of my talk is uh, "Your Name, Your Shoe Size, Your Identity: What Do We Trust in This Web?" And I guess I'll just go right in and start. I'll start with who am I? Uh, now that Nick has already said I'm full of shit, that is, it's true. <clears throat> just you wait, you'll see. Uh, so, who am I? And this is actually relevant for what I'll be discussing. Uh, the name of my birth certificate is Seth Hardy. I believe it's actually capitalized on my birth certificate. I'm just kind of lazy. Um, online, I use the handle Shardy. Uh, this is relevant. You will see why. Um, maybe you just don't give a shit about who I am. Uh, you're just here to see my talk because you have seen that I've given talks before. Maybe you don't care who I am at all and you just think all the talks here are cool. But I've done this sort of stuff before and I guess that's why I'm up here again. Uh, again, uh, this is relevant for the talk. I'm not just full of shit yet. So, I'm Seth. Nice to meet you all. I probably won't remember all of your names, but we'll try. Use light, drink. No. So, why am I giving this talk? Uh, other than... The, the long, long backstory to it. Um, I'll sum it up pretty quickly. Uh, it all started two years ago. Uh, the key signing party at the Fifth Hope. Uh, yeah, it was a bit of a mess. And then the key signing party here uh, was even better. And by better, I mean non existent. Uh, there was booze. Me? Yeah, I did. Nobody took them because people had either already signed them or didn't want them. He has this 1024 bit memorized, dude. Whatever. <laughs> but um, is, is there anybody here who was at the DEF CON 12 key signing party? Any of the three other people who were there? <laughs> okay. So we have one out of three. Um, yeah, there was, there was booze, but not so much key signing. Uh, and then. I was part of the key signing parties at 21C3 and then 22C3, and all sorts of fun stuff happened there, like people's keys getting signed when they didn't even show. Uh, very, very bad things. So it really prompted me to rant, and by rant I mean talk in front of an audience, about proper digital identity, identity management, and that is what I will be discussing today. So background. Who here uses PGP or GPG or anything like that? That's a whole lot of people. That's excellent. Uh, who here is familiar with the web of trust? OK. Who here is not familiar with the web of trust? All right. We got a couple people, and I know that some of them are lying. So <laughs> I'll give you the short, short version. Uh, the whole point of the web of trust is to do identity verification uh, and trusting people when you haven't necessarily met them before. So it's all about, you say that you trust a friend and you trust that friend's judgment to introduce you to new people. 
So even if you've never met that friend of a friend before, you still have a reasonable belief that they are who they claim to be. Uh, it's just trust extension so that you don't need to meet everybody yourself uh, before talking to them because it's very infeasible. So here's a diagram of a, a sample web of trust going from my key to other people's keys. Uh, the first step removed from my key are keys that I've signed and personally verified. After that are keys that I trust them because I trust the people I know as introducers. Uh, that's all there is to the web of trust. It's a conceptually very simple. It might be hard to explain in computer or digital identity terms, but it's something that everybody here does every day if you have friends. I, I can't guarantee that everybody here has friends, but <laughs> if you do, you do this all the time. Wait, 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 wait. I'm your friend, and I'm all wet. Not because I'm close to you. Thank you, sir. He was just in the dunk tank. Can have a drink? Of course, of course. Somebody kick the project at least. Oh. So here's an example web of trust. Uh, short, short version. I don't know where this is from. I just pulled an image off the web, and this is somebody's web of trust. Um, so I'm not here to discuss what the web of trust is, just the aspects of doing identity verification and management. So. I'm going to start with signing practices, and you will see very quickly where this is going, and you may or may not like it, but it might be funny. So here are the standard practices. What you have to do are two things. The first is you have to verify that the key is accurate. And what that generally means is you check the fingerprint over a secure channel. So you want to make sure that the key material actually belongs to the key that you think it's supposed to. So if somebody is handing you a key, then you want to make sure that the key data that you get matches up with the key data that they're giving you. If it's physically handed to you, that's easy. If it's over the internet, man in the middle attacks make that more problematic. So fingerprint verification means you don't have to verify the whole thing, you just have to verify a subset, and it works. The second step is to verify that the key ownership is accurate uh, in terms of who does it belong to. So the general practice here is you check the name on the key against some sort of photo ID. So you ask to see a driver's license or a passport, you look at the name on the key and if they match up then you can be reasonably sure that the key belongs to uh, who the key claims to be owned by. And to verify the email address, the common practice is you email your si the signed key to the email address on the key. And if they then get it and manage to upload it to a key server, then it implies that they have access to read that email and it's actually theirs. So pretty simple, pretty straightforward. In practice, it's not nearly so easy. And here's one of the reasons why. What do we do about pseudonyms or handles? Uh, what do we do about organization keys? Uh, who is security-officer at netbsd.org? Does anybody know? Does anybody know who this person or people are? OK, well, they've got 24 people who have signed their key. And they have signed three other keys. And they're only three hops from my key by four different paths. And this key might belong to a team. It might belong to one person. It might belong to a few people over the lifetime of the key. I have no way of knowing. There is no policy that I've been able to find that explains who is responsible for managing this key. But because it is one identity, it doesn't matter how many people are behind it, that one identity is collectively asserting statements about trust on other keys. And this is where the obvious problem comes in with digital identity management. You don't have a clear one-to-one -one correspondence between people or a name or a face and a key. And a lot of people treat it as such. Um, and to enforce this one-to-one -one policy, people write these extensive signing policies on what keys they will sign and what keys they won't sign. And this is really a good thing, because then you always know what you're getting when you see their signature on a key, even if it is completely detached from the framework of the PGP Web of Trust, you can still go back and reference it if you want to. Uh, so if you see a signature from somebody on a key, and you have a signing policy, you know what sort of verification 
for better or for worse, has been done on that identity. And there are all sorts of interesting key signing policies out there. I'll start with a few simple ones and then get to the one that I really have some issues with and the reason for this rant. So here's number one, the don't make me call your parents clause. Please note that I require that proof of identity something even for people I know personally. Uh, this is taken directly from somebody's key signing policy on their website. That's basically saying even if I know you and I've grown up with you, if I don't see an ID of yours, I don't have reason to believe or to trust you when you say this is who I am. And this might make sense if you've never met the person before, but if it's your childhood best friend that you've known for 20 years, then is there really a point of checking photo ID? Uh, are there any liabilities that can come from enforcing this sort of policy? Probably not, but you're limiting what you can do. And it just doesn't really seem to make sense. Does anybody here uh, check IDs of friends every time they run into them in person after it's been a few years just to make sure they haven't changed their name? Anybody? Okay, so this is mostly here to illustrate how Digital identity management is very, very different from real world identity management, and it gets more fucked up than this, so keep going. Uh, yeah, so how do you protect your keys? I, I see that most people in the audience here use PGP, but uh, how do you all protect your keys? Does, that, does anybody have any fancy ways, or do they just, you guys just keep it on your computer? Anybody? Nobody does anything fancy? Excellent. Well, they, they already do that for you. But I, anybody else? OK, so you just keep an encrypted copy. Anybody else have any fancy ways of doing this? USB key in a safe deposit box. USB key in a safe deposit Is that just a backup in case of problems? Yeah. What about the keys on your? standard machine that you use on a day-to-day -day basis. Who here has their PGP secret key with them at this conference? Can I see hands? You're lying, guys. Come on. Be honest. All right. <laughs> Not again. Not again. Um, I do. I have my copy of my keys here. Um, when, when somebody asks you how they keep track of your secret keys, it's, you're, you're, not, you're never going to get a good answer out of it because to use something, you need to have it accessible and the whole purpose of the system is to use it. So best case scenario of reasonable amount of security is great, uh, but if somebody has this dream that people are having five layers of security and never touch their keys to keep it safe, then they're just deluding themselves into thinking that they are staying safer themselves by not associating with these people. And that's not true. And you will see more and more why as I keep going. Uh, does anybody here, like, have I offended anybody yet by pointing these out? Does anybody here subscribe to these policies? If so, like, just stand and start yelling at me. I, nobody? OK. Uh, another signing policy is the not separation of user IDs. Uh, user IDs are there for human convenience just so you can associate a key with a person. And some people have this policy that if one of the user IDs doesn't work, they don't trust you. So if your email is down for a day, they don't trust you. If an email bounces because uh, your service provider's disk is full, then they don't know if they can talk to you encrypted because you're a very sketchy motherfucker all of a sudden. I don't know why, but they demand a satisfactory explanation. And that is completely subjective. And it, how, how do you satisfy somebody that wants to find fault? It, it doesn't work. And it just breaks the web of trust because then you don't build trust networks and you get these people who are security professionals not really connected to anything. But here's the best one. Nobody challenges photo ID. Does anybody here not require photo ID when signing a key? Please be honest. Okay, some people. 
Um, can I see a show of hands for people who do require photo ID for signing keys? Oh, almost everybody in the room raised their hands when they said that they use PGP, so work with me here, come on. No? Okay, well, photo ID is the thing that I'm really gonna get into, and this will all make sense. Um, would you take this as a photo ID? Uh, from you, no. Not, not from me, in general. Like, if the person looked like that and his name was actually first, middle, last name. Um, <laughs> I'm from the state of Massachusetts, and my ID does not look like that. It's a few years old, it looks similar, but pretty different. And if you're using a blue book or some other, if you, I got this picture off of the Massachusetts government's website that they say this is what a mass state ID looks like. So if you're using that as a reference for verifying photo ID, you would probably not take my photo ID, even though it is perfectly valid and it's, it's real, but it doesn't look like this. So this one's all right though. So far, so good. How about this one? Would anybody here take this photo ID? Is, is this guy here or something? Like, I just grabbed this off the web because he scanned everything in his wallet and put it online. <laughs> um, I don't know why you would do that, but this guy did. Um, I, guess, I guess he hates freedom or something. <laughs> did he scan the stuff in his wallet or his friend's wallet? <laughs> Supposedly his, but would, would anybody here not take this ID if this guy was trying to get you to sign his key? One, one point three. All right. Well, let's keep going. How, how about this one? Would anybody accept this one? I mean, with the face wasn't blurred out. And... <laughs> anybody? Come on. Would you take it or no? Yes. Yeah. No way. No? Why not? <laughs> All right. How about this one? There was actually a problem with this recently. This uh, ex-NYPD guy was going to a DOD building, I think it was, and he had to show ID, and even though it specifically said, do not take the matricula consular cards from Mexico, uh, he brought a fake one, I guess, and used it, and they granted him admission into the building. And then it made the news. Uh, it was pretty big, and their, their excuse was, you were already on the guest list, but it is a requirement of entry to show a valid ID, and this guy got into a DOD building, I think it was, with one of these. So, maybe you see where I'm starting to go here. Uh, what about this one? No? no? Why not? <laughs> yes, the... Too easy to forge? Okay. Um, what about older... Uh, state driver's licenses that are made with the same technology? No. No? Too easy to forge? Yeah. Okay. Okay, so the, the point being brought up here is at some point IDs become too easy to forge. Um, $27. Yes, he, he bought it for $27. 27 American dollars. So, if you've seen this one before, please do not say anything. Um, I've got a t-shirt here, and let's not look at the expiration date on this ID and pretend that doesn't matter, which it really doesn't, but the first person that can tell me what's wrong with this ID will get a t-shirt. <laughs> Sorry? Okay, yes. I heard it from over there from behind you as well. So, her last name is Lane. <laughs> Not Ellen, period, Lane. I found this ID when I searched for fake ID on Google Images, and it was one of, it was a blog of hers, this Sarah Lane, I don't know who she is, but she was writing on her blog about how she just turned 21 and this ID was great because it let her drink for about three years. 
and nobody caught the glaring error on it, or at least nobody said that they cared. So this is actually what a South Carolina driver license at that time looked like. It, I guess, it's, it looks good. It was accepted a lot of places, and it had a very glaring error on it, and yet nobody challenged it. So is she a PGP user? I don't know. Maybe I should track her down and ask her. <laughs> or at least tell her that her picture's all over the internets now. So does anybody here know who this is? Because uh, here's her ID. Uh, ignore the rotten.com URL on it. Um, but here's her ID. Her name is Barbara Pierce. She lives at 160 Madison Avenue in Baltimore. But for some reason, doesn't she look kind of familiar? D does anybody know who this is? Anybody? What's her name? Why does she look familiar? Well, that's her father. And that is her fake ID that she was busted with a while back. I don't know if it's just a bad looking ID or the Secret Service guys gave it away, but she was going around underage drinking and this is, I guess, what a Maryland license looks like. I have no idea. Does anybody here know what a Maryland state license looks like? Does it look like that? Yes? Okay. So maybe you're starting to see what I'm getting at here. And that's really reliance on photo ID just seems kind of silly. So I don't know what a driver's license from South Africa looks like. I don't know if you need a driver's license in South Africa. I'm guessing you do, but I don't know. And if somebody insists on showing photo ID and then they you know, just show me a piece of plastic with a photo and a signature on it, that may or may not work. It may or may not look anything like the real ID, but I wouldn't know. And a lot of people say you can't fake IDs easily, but on the other hand, you don't need to fake the ID in many cases. You just need to fool somebody into accepting a piece of plastic with a photo and a signature on it. Uh, even if the ID does look real or like what it's supposed to look like, how many people here uh, does any, anybody here uh, worked in a club as a bouncer? Yes? Uh, has it been difficult to spot fake IDs that are high quality? I wouldn't know how to do it. How would you know? <laughs> yeah. Like, if, if it looks like the real thing, like, are there secret tricks to identifying, like, how plastic peels or if, like, you hold it up to the light and bend it, it melts in a certain way? Or I, I, I don't know these tricks, and the bouncer friends of mine that I have just say they just smile and nod and hand it back. So, yeah, if, if she's cute, it's real. You know, ultraviolet. Ultraviolet. Okay. Yeah, yeah, the the blue book, but it. I've heard that it only shows current forms of ID. Um, I had a friend who was from Maine, and his license was a piece of paper with a photo stuck on it, crooked and it was laminated using a cheap lamination machine and the, the text on it was in typewriter. Nobody would accept it anywhere because it was the fakest thing they ever saw, except it was real. It was just from like 10 years ago from Maine. So the, the blue book works, but it's not perfect and it, it blocks a lot of people that may have real IDs. So it leads to the question, how does a photo ID prove somebody's identity? You're, you're not proving anything with a photo ID. You're just showing that they've convinced the government or somebody who sells fake IDs that this is their name. Uh, it, it is not proof of identity. It is implying that the identity is correct, but it's not proof. And a lot of people rely on it as proof, and they shouldn't. And why is what shot? And my laptop is now not working. Drink, drink. <laughs> All right, which one of you assholes is fucking with me? <laughs> no, really, who's? So what happens if somebody refuses to show an ID? And this is what happened at the key signing party here at DEF CON two years ago. Uh, there, was, there were two people out of the four people who didn't identify by their real names. Uh, they, have both, they, they both were speakers at many conferences before, so I identified them by handle on site. 
I, I already had an idea in my head, the face to handle binding, uh, but to some people that's not good enough. And having, a, uh, having an ID helps, but comparing it to social networking and reputation capital, it, it just seems kind of silly that you're arbitrarily picking one system for identity verification and choosing to completely ignore another. Reputation capital systems are actually very interesting and pe a lot of people are working on them and it just seems kind of silly. Well, how many people here, and I know you're not going to want to admit this, but please be honest, how many people here have a MySpace page? You people are losers. I mean, <laughs> every time you work on a system like that, every time you add somebody to your friends list, every time you do something like that, Live journal, yeah, you're, you're doing identity verification to a certain degree, and you're operating on the system of reputation capital, and a lot of times you're not using real names, and you're certainly not checking photo ID before you add somebody to your live journal. Why does it matter? Um, if you're doing it from a crypto sense, yes, you need to be more careful, but why are you cutting out this entire system of identity verification arbitrarily? And specifically in the hacker scene where a lot of people go by handles, it seems weird that people will not accept the handle of somebody who has been up in front of, you know, how many people are in the room right now? Uh, th this many people on a number of occasions, year to year, they're going by the same name every year. It, it just seems kind of silly that some people be like, oh, well, I don't know what your middle name that your parents gave you is, so I'm not going to sign your key, even though it has not, it, it's not on your key, it has nothing to do with your key. And as we all know, verifying a handle is impossible. Uh, does anybody know who this guy is? Okay. I, I've heard both Dark Tangent and Jeff Moss. Which is it? Yes? yes. Does anybody say one or the other? Everybody says both? Depends on the context. Okay. Okay, so it depends on the context, and that's really the right answer. It's. It is one person who has multiple identities. And as such, the identities might be split out over multiple keys, and they might be split out over multiple user IDs, but it is two identities to one person. Again, verifying an handle is impossible. So who's this guy? All right, moving on. Um, user IDs are for human convenience, and that's the point I'm trying to make here. So, the user IDs on keys bind identity information to key information. That's all they do. It is not a statement saying that you are absolutely this person and you only go by this name. It is just saying that the key material in this key belongs to the identity of this person. So. Does it matter whether you guys know me as Seth Hardy or Shardy? Does it matter to anybody? Would anybody be offended if I didn't go by my real name here? No? That's a really good point. If for those of you who might not have heard it, he said that uh, Shardy is full of shit and Seth Hardy is not. So I guess I'm maybe half full of shit. I don't know. But multiple identities, and in this case, it's funny because I don't view those two as separate identities. Uh, Shardy might be a handle, but it's also my first initial and my last name. Everybody's always like, is that a drug reference? I'm like, are you stupid? You know, it's, it, it's not separate identities. It's just one is within a certain character limit and is easier to type in when I want to check my email. Um, and some people are known a lot better by their pseudonyms, like... Uh, that guy. Uh, some people, I guess I'm known equally between the two because it's not really a pseudonym. But all I'm saying is multiple identities, one person, and oftentimes people who go by pseudonyms are doing it so that they don't have to give out their real name because they think that people like you are scary and don't want you to find out who they are. So that raises the question, why do people restrict what identity information they'll verify? And 
Open PGP standards supports photo user IDs. I've seen very few people actually use them, but I think they're one of the best things ever. Um, because if you see somebody and they're like, I'm not going to tell you my name, you can still sign their key and you can know for a fact that this person is the person that you talk to because you've, you've seen them. You, you see them physically and it's very hard to man in the middle attack somebody else's vision. So, well, denial of service is another matter entirely, but <laughs> the man in the middle attack, that's harder. Uh, so photo IDs are accepted, but I've never seen a phone number as a key user ID. And that's probably just because most people don't want to put their phone numbers on the key server network. Uh, but it just, I've asked people about that and they seem very genuinely surprised. Um, so now that that's all out of the way, uh, the real reason I'm talking here is because of the bullshit I pulled at the Hope 6 key signing party and my talk there on the Web of Trust. It was all a setup for this talk. Uh, basically, I decided to go in and see how much I can get away with. Uh, I gave a talk on PGP stuff and then I did a whole bunch of key signing events there and I just tried to see if I'm in a position of responsibility, what can I get away with? And if I just kind of smile and nod and act like I'm in control, what will people let me do? And the answer is a lot. Um, and there's also the question of how much do I have to pay for a crappy fake ID in New York City? And the answer to that is way too much. So let's talk about my new IDs. I got a few of them varying from complete bullshit to somewhat legitimate. Uh, the first one was an international student ID. It's real. Uh, it's a company that makes international student IDs and by that I mean they print stuff on plastic and have agreements with merchants to give you discounted stuff if you show their card. Uh, that's real in some cases, not real in other cases. It certainly does not have strict identity checking and it doesn't have a government backing it up. But it will get me discounts and I did have to fax in my expired student ID to get it. So there was a basic level of paperwork checking that I did have to go through to get this piece of plastic. Uh, then there was the overpriced Chinatown novelty ID, which very nicely says right across the top, like, this is not real. Uh, but it has a hologram. The hologram cost me an extra $10. <laughs> I figured the hologram for $10 would be a very wise investment because people would be like, oh shit, it's got a hologram, it's gotta be real. <laughs> I'll talk about that in a minute. And then there was also, like, one of my friends found some guy's ID on a street corner. And when I asked him if he knew where to get a fake ID, he's like, here, just use this guy's. <laughs> so I did. <laughs> Didn't work so well, because the guy, I looked nothing like him. But I tried. I tried. So <laughs> this one cost me $3 in Chinatown. Nobody took it. it. Didn't even get me into the 303 party last night. Here is my Chinatown fake ID. By the way, this guy's a fed. I know this for a fact. I'm his landlord. He's a fed. Um, but you can see across the top of the ID, it says personal non-government photo ID card for residents of Massachusetts. You can also see that they couldn't be bothered to come up with a Mass State logo and have a generic United States logo for every single state there is. But they gave me all sorts of interesting stuff like letting me figure out which color I wanted the Massachusetts bar to be and what kind of barcode I wanted. Just for the record, that's not my real social security number. Uh, it's also not my real date of birth, but it's close. Um, so this is one of the IDs that I use. And you can see the holograms. Seal of authenticity. Uh, you can also see that this ID says that my credibility status is a C. I found that very appropriate. <laughs> so one guy said, he was from Texas, and he was like, oh, so that's what a mass ID looks like? Never seen one of those before. OK, I'll sign your key. And then somebody else was like, it's got a hologram, so it's got to be all right. I told you the $10 was worth it. <laughs> More than one person just saw the hologram and just immediately assumed it was real. And I was just, I was so tempted to be like, that cost me $10. I'm, I'm sorry. That, 
10 bucks, I, I can go buy one for you right now. Um, and that ID got me into all the DEF CON parties this weekend, but uh, that's really not saying much. Uh, it didn't get me on a plane, but then again, I didn't want to go to jail, so I didn't try. Uh, but yeah, it's, it looks nothing like a real ID, and people, people who were local to the area cried bullshit, but everybody from other parts of the country just kind of smiled and nod, and some kind of looked at me pretty suspiciously, but some people completely bought it. And this was not even a good ID. It said right across the top, this is not a real ID. And people, people didn't even read it. Even after I pointed it out, they just kind of looked at it and smiled and nodded and went, OK. And it was fine. It said across the top of it that it is fake. I, and these people are security professionals. So here's my new key. It has three user IDs on it. The first user ID says that I am that guy that talked about the web of trust. I've talked about the web of trust a few times. I know this isn't very specific, but it is accurate. And when you're signing a user ID, all you're doing is saying that I state that I believe that this statement is true. And I am that guy that talked about the web of trust. I'm doing it now. Um, full shit. I'm also full of shit. I've also got 10 minutes, which is pretty good because I'm almost done. So the second user ID, and I'm going to verify it basically right now. Um, I wear size 11-ish boots. Um, if anybody would like to come up here, I can show you that my two boots are the same size. That I'll show you the size of my boots, and then you can feel my toes on the other boot to see that they actually do fit. And then you can sign my user ID that says I wear size 11 boots. <laughs> Plus or minus one half, these are actually size 10 and a half. Okay. All right. And you see? Okay. All right. They're the same size, and would you like to feel my toes? Come on, Nick. Oh, yeah. Does, does, does it fit? Huh? Just barely. It fits, but just barely. So you have Nick's word on it. I wouldn't trust Nick, but. What? You're wearing a suit. You're a sketchy motherfucker. So I also, Wrap I want to give up. out. Wrap it up. <laughs> Nick Farr has a posse. Does anybody want a Nick Farr has a posse yeah. sticker? First person to come up here gets it. There you go. Nick Farr has a posse. So why wouldn't, or, or actually, yeah, I, I was wondering why my phone was buzzing a whole lot, but let me, let me turn on the ringer so people actually can hear it. Anybody? Come on, come on, somebody. Somebody. This is my phone. Yeah, it might have crashed again. It's even got a classy ring. All right, so that's my phone number. Please don't prank call me. Um, so why, why wouldn't people take these, these IDs? I mean, are they less precise than what you usually get uh, with a name and an email on a user ID? I mean. <laughs> Yes, yes it is. Um, so is it less precise than usual? I mean, on my birth certificate, my full name is Seth Michael Hardy and it's capitalized, but on my key it's Seth Hardy. Um, and do you care if it's less precise as long as you know who it is? You can stop now, guys, come on. <laughs> like, do you really care if it is my full information or if it's just enough that you know who I am and can reference the key later on as belonging to me? Uh, less relevant, I mean, the phone number is pretty important. I'm, I'm not going to live this one down. Everybody's going to be prank calling me two years from now. And it's on the CD. No, th these slides are not on the CD. Um, I've got a basic set that's on the CD, but my phone number is not on the CD. Oh, shit, it's on the DVD. Oh, fuck. Well, shit. I just want, can I get some more tequila, please? All right, so what's the goal of signing the key? And the question is, do you want to talk to me, or do you just want to be a dick about, I'm not going to sign your key because I'm not going to sign your key? This is probably just going to be easier. Yeah. <laughs> so, 
some last thoughts before I wrap this up and answer and check my voicemail. Um, <laughs> Identity management is hard, but we have a lot of practice doing it. Everybody does it on a daily basis if you have friends. And if you don't have friends, now you can call me. So uh, user IDs are there for human convenience. And you should take advantage of this because it is a very flexible and robust system that works because you've had a lot of practice doing it. And humanity has had a lot of time as a whole fine tuning it. Um, why do people trust bits of plastic over reputations? I don't know. I'm a big fan of the reputation capital concept, and I subscribe to it, and I think you should too. My personal viewpoint, my personal viewpoint, and you can agree with it or disagree as you see fit. Some more thoughts. Um, I'll start with that last one. Please don't prank call me. I'll be sad. But I guess I've got a lot of new friends. Maybe I can like get some more MySpace buddies out of this or something. Um, but. I'm, I'm interested in seeing whether people trust my keys more or less after this. I, I am full of shit, as Nick pointed out, so. Is that your real key? That one, that was not a real key. It, it, it is a real key, I just haven't uploaded it to key servers because I don't want my phone number on key servers, even if it will be on a DEF CON DVD now. <laughs> so, in a culture where pseudonyms are common, I'm surprised that less people accept the concept of reputation capital. Um, a lot of people will drop a handle instead of a name, and people around here usually don't blink. So, uh, just something to consider. Two new voice messages, only two. <laughs> Please don't prank call me, I'll be sad. Um, so that's it. Uh, thank you very much for your time. There's my fingerprint if you want it. So. Uh, if you ask questions, please come up to the mic. Yes, you can call me back at 3 in the morning anytime you want to. Oh, yeah, yeah, I can call you back. That's what I was going to say next. Like, I got your number two, bitches. I got five minutes, bitch. So uh, are there any questions or? Why do you hate freedom? I hate freedom because it feels so good to hate freedom. Uh-oh, Nick has got to answer this question. Okay. All right, there's a reason that I'm saying this on stage during the second to last talk on Sunday. I issued, I told lower level goons, hoping that the message wouldn't get up, and it, it doesn't appear to have, but if you can come up with $1,000 for the Hacker Foundation and the instrument of death, meaning the 35 patty burger, because actually in and out will not give you more than a 35 patty burger because that stretches out the default boxes that they have. The standing rule, is if it's more than 35, you have to bring your own box. That can also be arranged. And don't get two side by side. That, that won't happen. But a $1,000 donation for the Hacker Foundation and the burger, wherever it is presented to me, I will eat it in answer to that burger shit. It's going to happen. Just you wait. And uh, Shardy, you have uh, two minutes. All right, two minutes. So do you, are people actually going to go through the effort to get a fake, I mean, if it's only $10, I guess, but a fake ID to do key signing? Is that seem like a legitimate threat model to I you? I am. Why would I want to sign your key then, I guess? Or, or why are you trying to get people to trust your key? What are you leveraging as an attacker to get someone to sign your key? Are they going to? It, it's not an attack. It's just showing that I'm, people are limiting themselves to a subset of trust building that they can do and that the uh, self-limiting in the form of security enhancement is producing no real benefits and is only limiting themselves from the things that they want to do. Yep. Thanks. Welcome. So wouldn't you also say that it's, comp I mean, uh, identification is essentially worthless if you have a threat model that includes anyone that actually issues credentials, right? I mean, anyone here that looks at an ID, I mean, who cares if it's fake or not? A real ID. Is, is, is essentially fake as well. If you don't know you, a person, there, there you There comes a point where you have to accept risk. If you didn't trust anything, you would never be able to trust anything. But, but an ID is, is worthless. I agree with you, but most people don't. Ah, idiots. <laughs> Anybody else? Just, just to clarify, are you going to trust like a a different ID, like he was saying, like like something that really looks legitimate, or something that, versus something that doesn't look legitimate. Is that, 
Or how else can you verify someone new that you don't have any reputation with and they're not in this system yet besides, you know, shoe size? What other, um, what other somebody thing do you propose as a 12, solution? A reputation capital. Uh, if, if, you can, I, if you have a way, no matter how weird it is, the user identity binding is for you and you alone. So as long as you feel comfortable with how you are binding the user to the identity, it's only there for your convenience. So if you can do it for yourself, do it. Don't, don't restrict it based on photo ID. So if you're comfortable with it, don't say, well, I haven't seen a photo ID, so I shouldn't. If you're comfortable with it, then it's good. Is there anything you can propose in the physical world that's going to be bound in this kind of system as someone new coming up to you without having already established that reputation system? No. I mean, okay. Web of trust, if you don't trust somebody and no contact implies no trust, then don't sign if there's no trust. More of a comment than a question. You also have this problem with organizations. When I moved to Seattle, I went to the DMV and they got my birthday wrong and then told me I had to pay them another license fee to get it corrected. Um, also, those international student ID people, I used their travel agency once and they said, are you a student? And I said, no, absolutely not, not for years, not in any way. And they said, great, snap, here's your student ID. It gets you a discount, here yep. you go. We're doing you a favor. Excellent. Wouldn't the uh, new national ID system just get rid of all these problems? No, because it would make <laughs> one target for faking. You, you come up here. So I think I'm getting kicked off stage now, so you should have some tequila and...